Thanks, folks. Okay, so uh, I'm Michael Genezareth, and I'm one of the uh, co-directors of, of um, Codex. And uh, I got the opportunity here to speak with you about, uh, about a topic that's been particularly interesting to me uh, for some time. In fact, it's the topic that we used to found Codex in the first place eight years ago. And it's a theme that has been one of the pillars, cornerstones of the, um, of the center since, since that founding. Uh, around here, it's called embedded law, or more popularly, the cop in the back seat. And I'll explain, hopefully, by the time I'm done, uh, just exactly what that means. Okay, so let me begin by asking you to use your imaginations just for a minute. So you're off in another city on a business trip, you get up in the morning, you have breakfast, get in your car and go off to, um, uh, to the first meeting of the day. And you're driving down the highway. What's the speed limit here? Uh, is that carpool lane open or not? Well, maybe there are signs that tell you this, and maybe there are not. That's good. Those could be the case. Can you use your cell phone in this state at this point? Well, there usually aren't signs that tell you that or not. All right, you get into the, the streets of the city. Can you make a U-turn on this street? Is this a state in which right turn and red is allowed? There are no signs about that. Uh, you finally get back to your hotel room after the meeting and you decide to do some chores. So you'd like to, for example, buy some, some drugs from that pharmacy in Canada. Is that allowed? Can you ship that alcohol you just picked up to your aunt in Virginia? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, some cho other chores. You're doing some things about your insurance. Does your mother's health insurance cover her in-home nursing care or not? So some of you folks as they say, in some of the cases, there are answers to these questions via science, but in other cases, they may be harder to get answers to. To be effective, we have to know answers to those questions, and often they're just not available when we need them without extensive work on our part or the expense and inconvenience of having to get professionals to help us answer those questions. Um, so what we're faced with, we citizens of the world, are, is a very complex regulatory environment we find ourselves in. Uh, as citizens, we are bound by regulations from multiple jurisdictions, federal, state, local jurisdictions. As members of organizations, we have business rules that govern our behavior within those organizations. We form contracts with other people or with other organizations. We're bound by the terms of those contracts. And as individuals, of course, we have our own private rules that we need to uh, respect as well. So there's a variety of different kinds of regulations and, and constraints on our behavior. Furthermore, some of those regulations can be very large. Uh, in a recent uh, article, in, not recent nowadays, but was once, the National Review was made clear that there are some things like the Lord's Prayer 66 words, the Gettysburg Address 286 words, 1,322 words in the, in the um, uh, Declaration of Independence, but for the sale of cabbages, 26,911 words. And the reason for that's pretty clear. When you go, go, go from very high general, very general principles down to the details of things like selling cabbages, there are many cases and issues that need to be considered. And so the number of uh, the size of the regulations grows. But it makes them harder to understand or harder to find at any rate the regulation that applies in a particular setting. And it's not just that they're large, but sometimes they're very complex. This the uh, release agreement for the University of Michigan. And it goes on and on and on. It's actually relatively simple if you think it through, but you have to read all that and understand all the cup clauses and how they uh, apply to each other. Uh, I have a case of my I ran into where my insurance, home insurance, uh, did seem to cover flood on page 20. It said water damage is covered. But on page 112 it said, Page 120 does not apply when, and he gave a conditions when that particular provision was no longer true. How was I to, if I didn't read to page 112, I wouldn't have discovered that. Well, except the insurance company told me. Okay, so there are these problems that we have. There's so many uh, regulations from many different jurisdictions. Uh, they're complex, so often in legalese. Great for you guys who are lawyers, not for those of us who are not. Um, and they're just big. 
So as a result, we sometimes see in society a lack of compliance, uh, certainly inefficiency when people do things they didn't, that shouldn't have done and didn't want to do, maybe wouldn't have done if they had known better, and, and generally sometimes a frequent sort of disenchantment with, uh, with the legal system. So that's, that's the situation, I, the way I perceive it coming to you folks as an outsider to the, to the legal profession. But as a computer scientist, as an information scientist, I see this as, oh gosh, what happened there? Oh god, apparently we're not plugged in. Why is it we're not plugged in? Excuse me, folks. Because we have to turn on the switch, apparently. Uh, so I see it as an information problem. There's all this information, it's complex information, and as an information scientist, I know how to solve problems like that. We use automation, we use computers to solve those problems. So can we do that here? Well, I actually think we can. This is because it's an information problem, I don't think it's insurmountable, but we do need to develop legal technology to address this problem. And that could include uh, work, mit, mit, uh, capabilities to help legal professionals, which mostly we're talking about in this, in this conference. It could include technology to help monitors and enforcers of the law, or in fact, maybe even regulators who are creating laws and regulations. But today I want to talk about one other constituency, the, to me the most important constituency, is the individuals who are concerned by these things, in, uh, who, are, who are affected by these rules and regulations, in finding those regulations and complying with those regulations. So that's what I'm after now. We know that, everybody knows that, we've got a lot of technology already deployed in the, in the profession. There's certainly we're capturing now online lots of statutes and cases and pretty much it's all out there somewhere and you can buy it from companies like LexisNexis or Westlaw if you want. Um, the problem is that what you're buying is a lot of text which now somebody has to read and somebody has to know how to read and you as a citizen had better be able to read all that legalese in order to use this information. Otherwise, you'll have to go and hire a lawyer, which is expensive and inconvenient because you, there's a time delay in the, getting the information that you need when you need it. So there is, however, an alternative to this approach and that's been growing within the Codex Center for some time. It's this notion of computational law, and elsewhere, by the way, uh, this notion of computational law. Uh, which has sort of been boiled down to the definition here. It's that branch of legal informatics concerned with the mechanization of legal reasoning. So the idea in, in computational law is the computer should not just be able to process the documents as you would any other document, find it Google-wise and then write, write, look at it in Microsoft Word and reformat it, but rather the computer actually understands the content of the documents as well. And it can use that content in order to do certain amounts of legal analysis and provide the fruits of that analysis to the individuals who have benefit, can take benefit from computational law. Okay, and we usually use this example of TurboTax as sort of the quintessential first computational law system, one of the first computational law systems. TurboTax, most everybody I'm assuming knows, it's a tax preparation software. You type in some information, it tells you your Tax law does a lot of computations, tells you your tax liability in accordance with the current uh, statutes. Okay, that's, that's good. It embodies the law in a computational form. It can actually mechanize that law. It can tell you what you need to pay. It just doesn't give you the documents which you need to read, but it actually does all that computation for you. So it's a really good example of computational law. And uh, there are, could be many other opportunities uh, that some of which we've identified as having potential for TurboTax-like systems in the area of building codes, electronic commerce, privacy, labor law, and so forth, where we think it's possible to create similar types of systems. So we'd like to see more of that. And I want to talk about that, and I want to talk about what's involved in making that happen, but also what more we could do building systems that are even better in some ways than TurboTax. Okay, so first of all, just let me spend a little half of what my remaining time talking about what are the components from an information technology point of view of creating systems like this. So I'm going to go through half a dozen slides here of just what's involved in building a system of this sort and, what's, and what are the problems. So much of that, uh, information available today on the internet as well as within organizations is in the form of so-called structured data. 
This could mean relational databases like the things that Oracle sells. It could mean XML files you may have heard of and other forms of data in which the relationships between the entities named in the data are, are very clear from the structure of the, 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 the data itself. For example, the rows and columns of the table or the sub-elements of XML documents. Much information is now being captured in this form so that it's amenable to, to processing by computational, in computational form. Now, what's going to process it? Well, the second part of computational law is usually not just the representation of data in this so-called structure form, but also the representation of the rules themselves in a form that the computer can work with. And this is uh, in an area commonly called computational logic, where you take uh, concepts, uh, rules and regulations. I've taken here some, a couple of examples from uh, uh, rules from an organization, a uh, definition of what it means to be an office mate, you share an office, or a, a policy of this particular organization, which is that managers and subordinates may not be office mates. It's illegal for X and Y, if X manages Y, for X to be an office mate of Y. So there's this, there are these languages now that one can encode rules and regulations in this formal form that now makes them amenable to computer processing. We take the data, we take the rules, and we can begin to build systems that can derive conclusions from that data and the rules. These so-called automated reasoning systems where the facts come in, that's the data. The regulations represented in this logical form are also provided to these automated reasoning boxes and outcome conclusions of various different sorts. All right, so this is well beginning to be well-established technology. I'll mention some of those shortcomings and limitations, but it's pretty strong. The, Pretty strong capabilities are available these days. Uh, before talking about some of the limitations, let me just mention some of the kinds of automated reasoning that are possible. So one of those, the obvious, more or less obvious, is that it's capable of detecting violations. You put some data in. Uh, John manages Ken. John's in room 22. Ken's in room 22. You've got some rules up there. You can't, managers and subordinates can't be office mates. And, the automated reasoning can determine that, well, that's, that can't be. There's something wrong there. You're violating those rules. That's just a matter of syntactically processing those, that computational logic formulas and the data. But it's not just this one use. The same rules can be put into other, uh, into the same automated reasoning program to derive other kinds of conclusions. For example, if we know that John manages Ken and John is in room 22, we know that we can't put Ken in room 22. This is more or less what happens in TurboTax. It tells you how to avoid illegality. It helps you to plan, if you will, solution your actions so as to not run afoul of rules and regulations. And the same technology can also be used to take rules and regulations and determine that, in general, there's some problem there. For example, they might be inconsistent. I've added a rule here that says all Skunk Works personnel must be housed in the same room. OK, well, that's inconsistent with the idea that a manager and an employee cannot share a room. So this is a bad policy for the corporation. They should solve this problem. The important thing is that the same technology that's now available can be used to determine, can be used to, to perform these various different um, computations. OK, so that's the good news. This is doable. And it's quite good. It's quite efficient nowadays. There are some problems. And I want to go through some of those problems for you, just to make clear that we haven't solved this problem entirely, and there's more to be done. In some cases, these problems are, are being dealt with today, but some of the ones I'll mention are not. So first of all, rules and regulations are not all black and white. If this is true, then you're illegal. Uh, some of these may require just not on what's true in the world, but for example, the beliefs. Some rules and regulations are determined not by whether facts in the world, but the fact about somebody's beliefs in the world, if the Secretary of State believes or is satisfied that something's true. Or things you don't know to be true, that, but you're going to assume to be true unless you know something to the contrary, the false. Or things like, like meta level. One piece of information is about another part of the document, one part of the doc, like my example of the health insurance, uh, the, the homeowner's insurance policy earlier, where one part of the uh, policy overturns another part of the policy. Good news, we actually know how to do most of these today. Um, not so good news. A example that I'm assuming many of you folks who've been had legal training is familiar with, the old no vehicles in the park case. So what does that mean? Uh, it means bicycles. Is that bicycle, a vehicle, or a skateboard, or uh, roller skates, or those vehicles, baby carriages, horses? And what about you know repair vehicles, emergency vehicles, or 
Uh, what about helicopters? Are there helicopters vehicles? And is helicopter in the park if it flies over at 10 feet? Well, that's another question. So this is a so-called open texture problem. It is we use words and we don't give sharp definitions to those words, and now we have to decide how to apply it. And that's what we usually use the court system to handle, and, and other after the fact to determine, yes, in fact, you know, a helicopter flying low is in fact a vehicle entering the park and is illegal. This is a problem we don't have a good solution for, but is an as a subject of active research, and there are some partial solutions to that. Another problem is inconsistency. So uh, sometimes you find that the state will have a regulation, and the federal regulation doesn't accord with that. Now, of course, there's, a, there's always a resolution between federal and state, so federal Trump state. However, in practice, that may not be the case. And in the meantime, we may have people acting in accordance with one set of regulations instead of another. We have inefficiency. And, uh, and, and societal disvalue as a result. And finally, not everything is logical reasoning. To be clear, a lot of what kind of reasoning that's important is based on things like case analysis, analogical reasoning. This case is like this other case, and therefore, uh, the precedent in that case should apply to the new case. That's not a logical deduction, and traditional approaches to that kind of logical reasoning I was showing you earlier need to be extended to handle this sort of analogical reasoning as well. So I don't want to give you the sense that I believe coming to you that every single kind of problem is solved for the rep in the representation of laws and the use of laws, but many of them are, and some of them are, uh, are, are still are on the on the burn on the front burner right now of research. Well, it turns out that industry hasn't been stopped by this. If you look at companies like IBM and SAP and Oracle, and I, they're making fortunes selling this technology applied to business rules as opposed to governmental rules. And the same problems exist in both cases, but they found ways of finding value for their constituencies using this kind of technology. So what I would like to believe, and what I like to argue, is that we should be able to do a similar sort of thing for governmental rules and regulations. Let's at least do the cases we can do and make that capability available to, uh, to the world now. And as things get better, that will get better as well. So this is my position. It has to do with computational law, and which I think now is ready for prime time, but doesn't, isn't finished yet, but is ready for prime time. We can start to use it today. Why today? Why not wait? Well, sooner the better, I think, from a societal point of view. But there's actually been a huge and, and by the way, this concept has been around for decades. Um, it, from, from at least the 70s or 80s, people were talking about using computers and automated reasoning to, to uh, knowledge representation to represent laws and, and, and automated reasoning to derive conclusions. But there's one big difference between the 80s and the teens, and that is the internet has come along. And with the internet and very cheap computers, an enormous amount of data is being captured in digital form and made available via the internet very broadly. Much of our lives, in fact, is mediated by the internet. I buy, I do most of my, a lot of my shopping, I don't know if it's most or not, but it seems like it is, on the internet. I book my travel on the internet. Every time I do that, a record is placed in some database of what happened. We no longer have to ask people for this. We don't have to go out and scrounge to find that data. It's there recorded already. So there's an opportunity to apply this kind of technology to data that is being recorded and is in principle generally available. So for me, I found, find that very interesting. And what it leads to is the next step that I, and the one I want to primarily talk about with you today about, which is this notion of embedded law. So <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, let's give, let me give you an example of what I mean by embedded law. Embedded law, first of all, embedded law is taking law and not keeping it in legal in the big law firms, not keeping it in small law firms, but giving it to the citizens. So that in their daily lives, they're seeing the law. It affects everything they do every day. It's available to them. All right, that's the basic idea. So here's an example. Uh, building code compliance is one of the first things that uh, we were looking at in Codex. Harry Surden was the fellow who, who uh, actually led this project called Project Calc to look into this particular application. The problem with building codes, if any of you have re redesigned a house or built a house, know your architect builds, produces the plans. The plans get set off to the to the city, the city spends three weeks looking at them and then sends back a message saying what all you did wrong, and then the architect goes through it again. So we've got this big cycle of three weeks or four weeks before you can actually finally converge on a plan that can be approved and built. 
why does it take three weeks? What in the world's the problem there? We've got a, I've got a architect who's using a CAD workstation, a computer. Building codes are pretty much bright line criteria like the tax code. Why can't they be put in the computer so that as the architect is building, is designing the, 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 the house, it automatically tells them that he put the windows too far apart or made them too small? Why wait three weeks? Why not embed the law in the world where the architect is doing what he's doing? Same for construction planners when they're planning things. What are the constraints on construction jobs, projects? Many places in the whole building code, uh, building uh, construction industry could be made more efficient by making these rules and regulations available via the, the digital technology they are already using. So this is kind of esoteric, okay, building codes, yeah, special, but, that's, but there's a lot more cases of how we might bring tech law to, to citizens. Not just every, virtually, well, most of you have either cell phones or, uh, or laptops sitting out there, that's one way, but wait a minute, some of you, one of these days, I don't see any at the moment, will have Google Glass as well, um, or you will have, as I suggested, your cell phones. Well, there's an enormous amount of computing power in there. There's no reason why that cell phone can't be the conduit for this kind of embedded law. I would like to be able to. One of the things I wanted when I became a graduate student is I wanted to be able to walk in the woods and look at a particular flower and say, what is that flower? Well, you can do that today. You get your cell phone out and take a picture and it'll give you a guess as to what the flower is. But what it doesn't do today is tell you whether you're allowed to pick it or not. But I would surely like to know that. And when I'm walk hiking in Maine, sure, I can pick that orchid. But if I happen to cross the boundary into, well, it doesn't bound border on Massachusetts, but if I were to get to Massachusetts, I'd find myself into trouble. In trouble because actually it's illegal to pick wild orchids in Massachusetts. But it'd be nice to know that, not just what it is, we're already doing that. Why don't we also say what's legal and what's not legal? Let's bring it right to the point of decision when you're about to do something. Uh, and why stop there? Why not put it in cars too? So we have vehicles that give us the information on the the uh, performance of our drive. We have speed speedometers, we have oil temperature gauges and all that sort of thing tell us how our car is doing, but they don't tell us the law. Why don't they? Why don't we have on the speedometer a little needle that says, here's the speed limit here. So you have how fast you're going and where the speed limit is. And oops, you're over the speed limit or you're under the speed limit. Can I turn left at this street? It's one way the wrong way. Can I park here at this hour? That all can be done via an enunciator in the panels of cars, and some of the car companies we've been talking with are very interested in seeing these legally enabled uh, uh, dashboards. And uh, it's not new. This has been going on for quite a few, quite some time now in the world of aviation. I happen to be a pilot, and I know because I've been using this for years, so-called glass cockpit, uh, which provides information to, um, to pilots on where they're allowed to fly and where they're not allowed to fly, those little concentric rings uh, indicate areas where you're not permitted to fly without being under having certain clearances. Uh, and so that's all we're talking about is taking that which has already been deployed fruitfully in the aviation industry and making it available to the world at large. This is embedded law, embedded in everything we do. Okay, so that's by the main idea. Let me just close up with a couple of, of remarks about this. I'm really excited about this and, and, um, and I think it actually is a fundamental change in the way the legal system works. If you go back to the early days when there was nothing written down, that was the law was whatever the ruler said. And then Hammurabi came along and, encode, uh, and created this code, 1750 or something like that, BC, I don't remember the exact date, uh, which was literally cast in stone. Now you would know what, what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. Okay, well, stone's not easy to disseminate, but printing presses make it easier to disseminate rules and regulations. And now we have documents available to everybody. They can read the law for themselves. They can read the law for themselves. They can read the law for themselves. You can read the law. Good luck reading all those hundreds of pages if you're not already a lawyer. What we need is something where the computer technology can be used to make the law understandable in the context of the situation you're in and can tell you yes or no, this is good or bad, or 90%, 80% probability that this is going to be problematic. So computational law is what makes that possible, and let's bring it to the point of decision of these decision makers. From a pure legal perspective, of course, it's hard to see how the law 
fulfills the potential of so providing full, uh, the, the full potential of social good that can be provided if it's the case that uh, people who are affected don't understand the law already. The purpose of the law is to allow us to predict what happened. One of the purposes is to predict what will happen if we act a certain way. If we don't know what the rules and regulations are, we don't know. That's this, where this disenchantment with the law often comes from. We don't know. It seems random to those of us who are not lawyers already. And in fact, if you read the Constitution, there is in fact, in certainly the 14th Amendment, I think there's some other amendment as well, which applies to this, which uh, mandates due process. Part of due process is notice. If you haven't, it's hard, to, it's hard, many scholars will argue you haven't satisfied the requirement of notice if the regulations are so complex that the affected parties can't understand them. So if we're really going to make the law work for us, then we have to, particularly as it, as it gets more and more and more complex in this increasingly complex world, we need to do something to simplify it. By using computational law and by embedding that law in, in our daily lives, we may be taking that next step in the, in the progression of the law. And we may be able to truly achieve that, that social good that the law is supposed to provide for us. OK, so that's my argument for you. I think the legal system is, is essential for us, but it needs to work better. And I think that, frankly, now is the time for bringing technology into this and making a much better legal system. OK, uh, I've strayed away from a lot of things like unauthorized practice of law and so forth. I know there are a lot of questions that you guys might have. I'm more than happy to, to, take, to take some questions now and or have some discussion of this. Um, but we also, we're, we're past 530, so. Uh, your call. Let's have a, just a couple, maybe a couple of questions if anybody wants to ask a question or complain. Aaron. Well, you know, that's a good question as to whether it does or not. You know, I, that's what we have been doing because it's what's been done in other areas. But frankly, I don't think that needs to be the case. If you go to medicine, for example, many sometimes the results in medicine are not are, come, are generated by machine learning programs, or alternatively, perhaps by some kind of natural, in the case of law, some natural language processing. My gut feeling is that in the early days, certainly encoding by legal professionals is the way to go. So I, I would say that, but I don't think it's an, you know, a requirement that it be done that way. I just think that practically that's the right solution right now. Any other questions? Gosh, I just persuade. Oh, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Ah, boy, thank you. That's, uh, those are the two big questions, right? The cop in the back seat is the point of the point of the cop in the back seat is the cop sitting back there as it tells you you're breaking the law. It's writing you the ticket as well, or as we like to think, it's just going on your bill, your DMV bill, you're, and you know, each month you're paying your tickets and, and, and going on your way. So yeah, that's possible. And uh, but of course, by the way, insurance companies have have been talking about this for some time putting devices in your cars to monitor your, your speeding and so forth, and they give you insurance rates that are adjusted based on this. So that's already happening, by the way. And the question is, from the point of view, whether that's a good thing to happen in the short term, what the ethical concerns with, I think that's an interesting question. I believe there are arguments that this would be good, and we're seeing it in the case of insurance rates. And I don't know the answers to whether or not it should communicate it back to the DMV out of my pay, pay grade to, to answer that question. But what I am concerned with is at least giving the driver the information that, that he or she needs. Uh, what was the other? Was there another? Second question is the stop. Oh, yeah, OK. So there's this other notion of what's called regimented system where, uh, and it's often, I mean, we, we, computer systems are often regimented. You know, if you don't have security, you can't get in because you don't have the password. It, you could allow you to go in and then say, uh-uh, uh-uh, you're not allowed to use you know, Harry's account. But it doesn't. It actually stops you. So it could also stop you from speeding. And I, I think that would be very bad at this point. And so I, I, we've talked about how this would work in autonomous cars and whether autonomous cars must obey the law. Um, was it were you, Jerry? Was it you who gave that example on Wednesday? Somebody gave the example on Wednesday that you're in the intersection. You see some tractor trailer barreling down the crossroad at you. And uh, you'd better speed through the intersection to, to avoid being hit. So, it, but no, the only thing won't go faster because it would be exceeding the speed limit. So we'd like to make sure that there's always provision. In the aviation industry, 
the pilot always can take over and can adjust anything. Has to explain afterward why he did it, but it's always possible. And I would say that that's probably the way it should be done. Um, you're responsible if you violate the law, but you may have good reasons to, and so we don't want to stop you from doing that. Great questions. Anybody else? Yes, Brad. Yeah, yeah, right. I, I noticed. The text message would be better. Right, yeah. Right. Right. So is that the right way to code that rule? Is that is that the right rule and regulation? It may be that it isn't. Rules and regulations are done for an old in an older world where we didn't have this technology. Maybe our rules and regulations should be different. Now I'm going to suggest something that I actually don't like, and I'm sure you're going to all hate as well. You could have differential speed limits depending on who the driver is. Older drivers or maybe people who have lesser uh, eyesight might have to go slower than drivers who are teenagers. <laughs> and I know people who've got <laughs> people. Uh, so I think there, there are alternatives. Already we see variable speed lanes in, in some places. I think there is, there's adjustment that one can do and make the, the laws actually can be more complex in a way. But because they're, they're mediated through technology, they actually serve a, they, they're, they're more efficient for, for society. And you know, maybe it's the case that there's absolutely no traffic. You are allowed to, to go through that intersection in that case, or at least you won't, you won't be given a text message right away. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting, it's an interesting example. I didn't, that's, that's, I'll have to remember this one, add that to the list. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, as a pilot, I really like having the backseat driver. It really helps me to know that it's telling me that I, it saves me from making a mistake. And I think the same is true of the car. As long as it's telling me what, what mis, how, helping me to avoid making those mistakes, I think I would like that. Is the tech adjust the amount of information sure. that it's getting? Yeah. I think it's a great idea. You could have a little profile over there where you turn some things off. I don't see any reason why that couldn't be done. Dan, is that you? Yeah. That's not like a statement rather than a question, but I think it's a good statement. Well, I, the optimizing is, I think it's technically feasible. In fact, there already are technologies out there to, to help people have optimal routes through cities based on red light uh, traffic, of course, and then also red lights. And so they'll take you a different route, or maybe a longer route because you have fewer red lights. So this technology is already deployed. I think that that could potentially be enhanced in, in along the lines of what you're talking about, and that would work. So I, I like this idea. I think what's, what, this what this technology is doing is opening up a, a, a variety of possibilities and raising these questions for us. I'm certainly not, I don't have answers to the questions. I, I'm, what I'm saying is I think it's nice to have the possibility and not to be stuck in a world that wasn't was in stuck in a, in, a, in a legal system that was designed for a world without this technology. Let's modernize our legal system to take advantage of the technology and make sure we deploy the technology to, to make a better legal system. 
Oh, yes, go ahead. Yeah. But I know, you know, when I have a simple DUI to meet somebody and they have a breath test, I go, well, okay, show me that that was working properly, show me that it was working properly. And it's fairly simple to understand. But, you know, we're getting into areas now where I need some foundation that things are working, that, you know, who's going to, who's going to know if they're, if all of this is working properly, that these things with the car are managing, you know, am I going to be able to, Somebody going to give me that data, and who's going to know what to do with it, and, and why you're so complex. So, I mean, how, I guess my question is, how easy would it be to um, also program in, a, you know, some way to prove foundationally that the, that everything that's being told to that driver is accurate, yeah. or that they can be reported automatically out to, you know, uh, police or insurance companies. Yeah. So uh, c there are a couple of issues there. So first of all, t could the technology be, could the computer be broken? Is it making mistakes? I mean, computer technology is pretty darn good right now. It either crashes or it's up. And it's pretty darn good otherwise. And so I think that is not necessarily, there's software problems, but software problems as well as hardware problems are often solved by certification. And that's what happens in the FAA world is they're carefully, take, it takes a bit to certify one of these devices. But then it's pretty darn good at that point. And so I think that's going to would be the same thing we would do in the case of cars would be to make sure that they are certified. There's a little you know seal on it that says this was certified by, same as your smog check is or something like that. There's a certification that the thing is working correctly. That's the way I would see that that playing out. Um, I there's some other part I was going to make about that. I forgot what the other part was. Um, yeah. So, but but you know, again, I'm there is you're going one step further, which is that you're proposing that somebody will use this information that's external to the car or, or external to whatever the architect or something else, and that's a step which I think is interesting to take, but it's not necessary. What I'm talking about could happen even without that, where it's just giving a, giving the driver an analysis of the situation as it sees it to help the driver make better decisions, but not necessarily re reporting externally. Of course, I don't see how society would stop there, but. I, uh, but, right. Anyway, I, uh, okay, well, I just wanted to present this idea. Again, this is, I put at the end of the day here because this was supposed to be the kind of what's the futuristic, we're talking get into the, you know, about ideas that hopefully will have a, their play at some point. But I wanted to in, infect you all with the idea if I could so you begin to think about it in ways in which uh, it, it could be, um, be deployed and to raise these kinds of questions and maybe offer solutions for from the legal side or any other side that would help us to solve some of the, some of the pitfalls that we see along the way. Anyway, thank you very much for listening and thanks for coming to the conference.